Employees expressing their ideas, grievances, suggestions at work. That's the definition of VOE, voice of employee. Well, after a quick Google search, anyway. That's great. That is gold information for leaders who are trying to create an amazing workplace. If you know what your employees need, want, their troubles, their challenges, as leaders who want to create a workplace that we all love, that's unbelievably good information. And many organizations go about getting this vital information, usually with a survey. Usually once a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. And then sometimes they don't do anything with it. Or they cherry pick the information that they're provided. Or they ignore it at all. Really, it's a big opportunity that sometimes gets missed. And this data is essential. Employees are using their voice, but how are organizations listening to it? And what are they doing with what they've heard? My guest today has some stories to tell and info to provide on how you can do right by your employees and on what they have to say. Hold on, we're gonna learn how we can build some trust. Russell Lolliker, host of the Relationships at Work podcast, the guide for emerging leaders to create a workplace we love. I've been in communications for a very long time, longer than I care to admit, but uh, back in the early days when I was getting my education, uh, survey tactics were something that we were trained in. Uh, by trained, I mean one course that half of us sort of paid attention to. One of those courses. One of those. It was like when I was in radio and there was that one course about how engineering was incorporated into soundboards. And yeah, you were looking at the paper beside you because you really weren't paying attention because you wanted to play with the microphones. This was kind of the same thing in the communications realm. In hindsight, I probably should have paid more attention because surveying really isn't my, well, my experience. But fast forward, as a communications guy with decades of experience, my curiosity has just exploded on how we listen, our actions, all as it pertains to the employee experience. And this episode is really going to help me and help you with that. I was looking recently at a Forbes article where they were talking about the uh, Workforce Institute report. It came out not too, too long ago. The report surveyed 4,000 employees, managers, and leaders across 11 countries. Results, eh, not so good. 86% of the employees they surveyed said that people weren't heard fairly or equally at their organizations. 47% said that the underrepresented voices, like essential workers, younger workers, uh, those who identified as different races, ethnicities, they continue to be undervalued by the employer. And 75% that they don't feel heard at all when it comes to things like benefits, safety, and time off requests. So we're really talking about the voice of the employee and organizations listening. And that's where people analytics come in. I loved my chat today with Dr. Khalifa Oliver as she really looks at all the things we should be pay better paying attention to so we can work with those we work with. It's really important that we get into things like this people data, this people analytics, because as she says, every data point, well, that's an actual person. So as an organization, what are we doing to listen and what actions are we taking? Because that at the end of it is where trust is, employee trust. And we all talk about that enough. And this is one of the ways we really build it. Let's go over to Khalifa. And on the show today, we have Dr. Khalifa Oliver. And here is why she is awesome. She is the founder and managing partner of Deep Dive Consulting. What's that, you ask? Glad you did. A consulting agency to help organizations bring together leadership, employee experience, data analytics to discover value, retain, elevate. It's all about the talent. It's all about the talent. She has a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. She has certification in people analytics from MIT. I'm not done. The breath is almost out, but she has 15 years of experience working in academia and the corporate world, all about people data, including organizations like Walmart, Wells Fargo, Stanley Black & Decker, all to improve people's strategies, programs, and analytics. And here she is. Hello, Khalifa. Hello, Russell. How are you? 
I'm delightful. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Today's VOE, and for those who don't know acronyms, it's Voice of Employee, but specifically all about the numbers, the stats, the data, what you need to get, what you need to understand to better serve those you're supposed to be serving, your employees. But before we get into any of that, we have to ask the question we ask all of our guests, Khalifa, which is, what's your best or worst employee experience? So my worst employee experience is what I'll choose. And because it's such a timely thing right now. So I think the worst experience I've had as an employee thus far has been laid off um, from my job. And it was typical of what we're seeing now. It's not a performance issue. It's a cost measure, right? And it it does feel incredibly dehumanizing. And in that moment, because a lot of our socially, a lot of our identity is so tied to work. And I think it was only in that moment I realized how much of my adult identity was tied to me working. You know, when it happened, when I spoke to my ex-manager at that time, who himself was also um, like, oh, he told me my mind would play tricks on me for about a week or two. And I promise you it did because you start like going through scenarios in your head, right? And I'm okay, right? It took some time. I was okay. But what I started to realize is I did need a break. It was almost like a forced sabbatical. (laughs) I did need a break. I did need time to process my feelings, right? Because I woke up the next day without a job to go to for the first time in my adult life. And it felt strange. And the entire experience, when you tell somebody, it's okay, it's just, it's not you, it's us. We're cost cutting. It makes you not feel human. It makes you feel like a thing like a part of a balance sheet. And as somebody who's advocates employee experience and really thinking through how do we humanize processes and make people sense of decisions and make experiences, even the bad experiences, not feel so bad, um, that's not what happened. (laughs) It was not the best experience. And so for me, it felt like I'd failed, but I'm fine. It turned out for me to be a forced break that I was not taking. It it forced me to really think about and reevaluate what I wanted to do. And I had long advocated in my career about layoffs and when bad things happen at work. And it, it occurred to me in that moment was the first time I had experienced it so suddenly, so unexpectedly, right? And I say this and I tell this story and this is the experience I tell because so many people are going through it right now. And I want them to know if you're going through it, if you have gone through it, if you think it's on the horizon, you'll be okay, right? You're going to come through on the other side. You're, you don't worry about how you feel the feels, <laughs> feel the feels. You, you have to kind of go through it. Don't let anybody tell you not to worry. If you got to go through it how you want to. Just don't stay in it because you'll be okay. We have to learn as a society that our jobs do not have to be our identity. Um, We make our jobs and we'll be okay. So I think that's, that's why I shared that example. But organizations can also be less assholes about it too. Like we're hearing stories. Absolutely. We're hearing stories about people finding out they got laid off because their security card didn't work. Like that's how they're finding out. That is, you know, there's so much competition that I call the race to the bottom. Like, we don't all have to try to figure out ways to make it terrible. Like, it's not a competition to do that. And I think that what's happening is some companies are giving other companies permission to be assholes in that scenario. They're normalizing it. Right. And there there are companies that have done it really well. There are companies that have really made the effort to do better right? And like they, they messed up one round, they're doing better. I've seen the improvement. I've seen the effort that people go through, even in the present company that I work for, there were layoffs. It's not ever, there's no good way to lay off anybody. There's no good way to do it, but there's bad ways, <laughs> you know? And I've seen improvements, the effort it takes to really communicate, humanize it, people center it, really let leaders step up and talk about it. And and not just for those who have been laid off, but those who stay, because I think there's two different types of PTSD. Um, that said, let me say, Something that pisses me off on LinkedIn, if I could say it, it's like, if somebody gets laid off, allow them to feel it. Don't be going on LinkedIn, making it all about you. Hey, y'all, I still have my job, but, you know, if I can help, stop it. 
stop it. Stop centering it about you. You know what I mean? Like you could, you could, I am them. You just trying to make a show. Stop making a performance out of trying to be a hero. Like, stop it. Um, <laughs> we hit a nerve. We hit a nerve. Right. Really just like TSA, right? It, mess up. I, I, it irritated me before it happened to me, but it definitely irritated me. Like, come on. Just walk away. Fair. Go stop. I am Fair. them. Like, stop making a whole scene like you're a hero. Sit down somewhere. <laughs> So maybe if we listen to our employees throughout the journey, throughout an organization, that maybe we won't get to these, you know, experiences, this theater of lack of kindness. So exactly. I want to start off, I want to start off because we don't define things well enough. I brought this up a lot in the podcast where we say things a lot, but we don't define things a lot. So I want to start by asking you first, how would you define VOE or voice of voice of employee? I think a voice of the employee is any way that an employee is trying to communicate with you about how they're feeling at any given point in time or how they're reacting to any initiative or program that you put through at any point in time. I think the mistake people make is when they think of VOE, they think of a survey, right? But people people have multiple ways of telling us what's going on with them. It could be through their movement, right? What is your attrition starting to look like? Because that's a voice, right? They are telling you, I don't want to be here, <laughs> right? It's whether they're moving away from one manager or moving from one department into the next department, right? You can data scrape. The one thing I tell organizations is if you don't find a way to harness the voice, the way the people are going to express to you what is happening within the organization, they will find a way. That is human nature. They will go on glass door. They will go on blind. They will sabotage. People will always find a way to communicate how they feel. That is human nature. And that's what a voice of the employee is to me. It's any way, however they're doing it, they are creating a voice. And sometimes that voice is unheard, right? It is something that you have to recognize. So how do you quantify, qualify that information, especially because I know you mentioned people think it's a survey. Well, they go to a survey because it seems like the easiest way to collect information. So what is the bridge from VOE to people analytics? So I think it's the quality of data, right? I think we don't focus enough on the quality of data. So a survey is just one way of collecting data. And then you have all this HRS data on your people. You can get as fancy as you want, like network analysis, where you're really trying to understand the connections between people. You can look at where people are going. Where's your traffic going within your intranet as you try to communicate things? All those are ways that you can actually pull data. You have qualitative data, which I will tell you, unstructured data is some of my favorite data. Like I, I'm a survey advocate, but listen, I love me some unstructured data because a lot of times, uh, uh, just like any other thing, a uh, survey is often biased to the person who's creating it, the person who's written it, right? Because it's close-ended and you just have to assume you know things about everybody. But you find things in open text that people that you don't ask about, you don't think about, right? So there's a privilege of things that I don't have to think about when I'm designing a survey. That's somebody who might be in the manufacturing plant, they think about. They, that is never something that will occur to me. And when you really do natural language processing and text analysis really well on unstructured data, it gives you this wealth of richness and robustness in data that adds context and color to the story of your people. And so that's what you have to do. Look for data in places that you may not think data exists. And if nothing else, the simplest way to get to the voice of the employees, just to ask them. I think we, we we try to get too fancy sometimes, but sometimes you go back to basics. The simplest way, especially if you're just starting out trying to understand the voice of the employee, just understand how people are feeling, just ask them. Walk around, ask them. Uh, send a survey, have a couple of focus groups, like ask them to write things down. I think, look, like if you have an internet, really read what people are trying to say, because people, again, will always, the voice is always there. They will tell you, they will tell you the things. You just have to listen. I'm trying to do a chicken or the egg thought in my brain right here. And I'm trying to figure out how best to ask this is, should you be surveying, collecting information with an agenda, with an idea of what you're looking for? Or should you be just be collecting all information all the time and then try to pick apart what you need like where's the best approach for that i think it depends on what you're trying to do so i'm giving you the full psychology answer right it depends now the smartest way to do it is to never have preconceived notions of what you're going to collect 
because what you're doing is just throwing biases in there and that is hubris, right? That is hubris on the part of many people who are in my field who are like, I know everything about people. I, I know what I'm going to get. And too many times what you will find is when you're designing a survey or a tool or some sort of assessment, you are led by the voice of whatever leader is trying to get. The worst thing you can do is try to make the data say something. Data should speak for itself. So the most, the purest and best way is to go with without expectations. You should have a broad view of what you're trying to understand about the experience. So like when you're trying to understand the voice, you think about key factors across industries that will affect people. So like career development, leadership, company, uh, reputation, satisfaction, job clarity, you know, those type of engagement. Those are key broad things. And then you write tools or create programs to get to that. But sometimes there's something strategic that you're trying to find out. Something something has changed, something is new. So like you might be doing a new manager um, assimilation where you want to know more about what is the temperature of the room. In those cases, you you want to write to the agenda of the things that you're trying to find out. But the, the best approach is always as far as possible to go in there acting like you have no idea what you're going to get back. And I think that allows the analysis to be richer, the data to be richer and cleaner and more honest, if you will. I keep hearing about survey fatigue when it comes to asking questions. I like a good eye roll. Please tell me the source of that. <laughs> my philosophy, and I will say it till my dying day. Please do. Survey fatigue is made up. Okay. It doesn't exist. It is not a thing. We've made it up. It's an excuse. It's blaming the vessel and the platform for inaction on our part. People are not sick of surveys. They're sick of us. <laughs> right? I tell leaders, they're not sick of these surveys. They're sick of you. People will take 100 surveys back to back if they truly believe that something concrete will come of it but th i'm like think of it in just everyday life if i keep telling my bff the same thing you keep asking me please what do you want to eat please what do you want to eat for dinner and i'm like i want pizza and you're like okay what you want to eat pizza what do you want to eat pizza and i can't get no pizza yet i'm not gonna keep answering your question i'm gonna say i'm sick of you stop asking me the question you know you're gonna bring me a burger every time so stop asking my opinion after a while i'm gonna be like you're gonna get me a burger anyway so i don't care i'm not answering the question you don't really care about my opinion so i can't blame the question what do you want to eat i can't blame the vessel that he's asking me i'm even sick of him stop asking and so that's why I'm like, it's not survey fatigue, it's an action fatigue. Any way that we measure, any technology we use, people can get sick of, but it's not the thing. It's just the easiest thing to blame. It also allows organizations to distance themselves and not take the responsibility for not acting on what people are telling them. So like, it's a survey's fault. No, buddy. Well, I, I get that too. When people tell me they're like, well, you know, nobody likes emails anymore. I'm like, no, people don't like shitty emails anymore. If, <laughs> if you're a better communicator. Stop, stop, right. Stop <laughs> telling, stop sending me an email that says, okay, it was unnecessary. It pinged me. It stopped me from doing what I was trying to do. Like, stop. Totally. Where is the line when it gets to, and I'm still sp sitting in the realm of myth, which is people might feel like they're being too big brother or too asking too personal questions. Like where is the line where it's about improving the organization versus prying? And that's where I think there should be a strategic reason. I do not believe in building voice listening systems or continuous listening systems if there is just collecting data for collecting data sake. Because when you're strategic, you really think about the outcomes. You think about privacy. You think about the ethics of what you're doing. And there should be an outcome that is tied to it. And the outcome should not just be to make you feel better. Because that's where it becomes monitored. When you're monitoring and surveilling, just to monitor and surveil, and everything that comes of it, the only thing you act on is punitive, then that's the line where people are just like, this is stupid. But if it's strategic and you're really trying to make improvements, you're trying to make actual improvements in the everyday life of your employees with the aim of constantly setting them up for success 
right? When you set your employees up for success, you are also setting your company up for success. You are, re you are thinking about your bottom line. It is just a longer term investment. When you're doing that, then when you truly think it through, when you have the end goal in mind, as in these are the actions we want to take, this is the investments we want to make, this is why we're doing that, then it's not big brother. Big brother is when it's just, I'm just listening to a lesson. I'm just scraping data to have it because I'm going to use this whenever I feel to make it as punitive as possible. That's big brother. When there's a lack of ethics, a lack of really thoughtfulness about privacy, when you are just collecting that data to sit there to use, like rubbing your hands and stroking that imaginary bear, just waiting, then I can't, I can't support that. That's not voice of the employee. That's you being a complete and total asshole. That's all that is. <laughs> now we, we kind of focused on surveys quite a bit, I, I'm, but you did mention that survey can be just one of many tools to collect that BOE. What are other approaches that maybe organizations are ignoring because surveys their default? Yeah. Well, when I think about continuous listening, when you're thinking of voice of the employee, I think about four approaches. What is what we call voice listening? At least I call it. So it's four signals, right? I think people send four types of signals. One is voice signals, right? That is what people are saying to you with their voice. That is self-reported. And so that includes CVs, but it's also focus groups, right? It depends on what you're trying to do and how big, how fast you're trying to get information. CVs are easy because you'd send out a lot very quickly to a broad group of people, but sometimes you really want to center on something. And in many cases, I recommend focus groups as a result of something you find in a survey, right? So there's, there's that. You know, there are asynchronous listening AI tools right now that I am in love with, which really a lot, it's a, fo it's, a, it's, it's a focus group, but it's not a focus group where everybody has to sit together at the same time. And it allows people to do it at their own pace and you're getting their voice. There is also intranets that you can scrape. You can scrape the intranet. What are people saying on our intranet? How are they responding to our communications? Are we saying the right thing? Is there something with our tone that people are complaining about? Is there something that we're not communicating? And then you go to things like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, blind, whatever, fishable, whatever else is out there now. And you could really get a sense of how people are actually reporting about you, right? And you can really do some data modeling off of that. The other thing is what I call movement signals. And so that's more of the objective data that companies collect, you know, things like, how do we use the PTO? Where are people going? Are they leaving the organization? What is the average tenure? Are they staying? Who's staying? <laughs> Why are they staying? Right? And so it, it gets you an understanding of how people are moving around. If they move, do they leave the industry? Are they just going to a competitor? What's happening? Because that's also telling you a story. That's them telling you what's, how they feel about, about you, right? Um, the other one I call connection. And this one is one of the things I love. Um, uh, it's organizational network analysis. And a lot of companies do not use this because this is one of the things that for many people, it feels big brothery, <laughs> right? It feel, it's the one that I think makes some people uncomfortable. But I think it's because organizations, when they misunderstand it, they have leaders who abuse it, right? Org network analysis, the idea of it is to really understand how people are connected within your organization. Are there nodes and pods and how are they networked with each other, right? For example, you could, under, you could understand who are influencers in your organization, right? Who are the people who everybody goes to for answers? They're communicating with everybody. They bring different teams and departments together. If you, this person has been in this role forever. If this person leaves, we break all those connections. So this person is more critical than we expect. This person probably should be promoted. This person is seen as an organizational leader and you don't realize that, right? Or you might realize that there's some groups working in complete silo, which may be impairing productivity and we have to figure out how to connect how these people work. It's even more important to do things like that in this world of flexible location and, and remote work. Is there a difference that we're seeing in how people are connecting and the ways they're 
connecting and and our meetings too long and you know there there's an interesting metric i've seen with um microsoft's ONA where you can see how many how much managers are in meetings with their directs right because that's duplicated effort do you need to be and all that that's that's a lack of productivity right what's happening um in terms of is there a gap that needs to be filled that means the manager needs to be in these meetings because what that does is prolong their day the last one is another one that i think is um underutilized i call it connection so, sorry click signals click signals i'm a big fan of like uh, user experience how we try to communicate things to our employees is what empowers them to be able to do their jobs properly and we often don't think about when I post a policy in my intranet, are they going there? What are they actually clicking on? Mm -hmm. Are people looking at our benefits policy a lot, which means do we need to do more work on our benefits? We think this is important, but all the traffic is going over here. When we post a certain message, the traffic response is great. We post another one, it's not. And so the leaders are here thinking, well, this is really important. Everybody will love this, but this is important to you. But clearly what the data is telling us behind the scenes is that is actually what is important to our employees. That's what they're telling you and they're telling you in their behavior and they're telling you what they're clicking on across your organization and what they're doing. And I think that informs so much. Like if everybody keeps clicking on benefits and then people start leaving and they're saying, because these benefits don't work, there is an issue with either your benefits package or how you're explaining what benefits people have and it's unclear and it's causing uncertainty and people rather get away from it. So those are the four elements that I use when I think about employee voice. So there is one big weakness when it comes to collecting data and that's because it involves human beings. Now you do. It involves hum humans and they're annoying. <laughs> you did mention off the top that there is either agendas or bias. What else gets in the way of properly collecting this information? Trust. Mm. Well, let me, I'll start with trust. The other thing is investment. And I talked about that. People are often unwilling to hear the truth. So often you'll get, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear. Right. I think this is what our culture is. And I'm the one coming in with the paperwork going, mm, not so much. That's not the culture. When I help organizations come up with continuous listening strategies and building out their listening programs and their employee experience programs, the first thing I say is, if you're not ready to hear it, you're not ready for a program, period. We are our own worst enemy. Trust is one of the biggest things. If you really want the employee voice and you're willing to act on it, you've got to take some time to build trust between the employee and the leadership. You have to. If you don't have that trust that I can tell you the truth about where we are and I will act on it and you will acknowledge that I said it, then there's no point. It's like speaking to a wall. What is the point? And I think that is one of the biggest things people take for granted um, with employee voice. And the other thing is honestly having people who truly understand people data. And I know that sounds silly, but something I've seen with a lot of organizations is they think just because people can work with data, they can work with people data. Nay, nay. <laughs> because people are unpredictable and people require context. And thinking that you can just work with data, which means you can work with people data is not true. And I think we know that inherently because we do so well on the customer side. And those are people too. But then when it comes to our employees, we act like we forgot. <laughs> A lot of the techniques, the voice techniques that I talk about, We've been doing it with customers for years. We've had personalization for customers for years. The difference is that customers are on the right side of the balance sheet, right? We think they bring in money and we think that our employees fall on the side that we just, they're just expenses, right? And, and we got to rethink how we see employees. We've got to rethink it. You touched with trust, I immediately think culture, because if you don't have trust, or if you do have trust, I mean, both those are examples of the type of culture you have in an organization. I've had a lot of conversations that I believe anonymous surveys are a sign of a broken culture. 
because people don't feel mm. they can be themselves or attach a name to the data. What are your thoughts on anonymous surveys? Because they are so prevalent. I don't love anonymous surveys, but I'll tell you, depending on where you are in your culture, sometimes it's the best thing to do, especially if you're on the start of your culture journey. You just need the truth. If you just want the lay of the land, that is the best thing to do. If you're trying to make informed decisions, anonymous surveys are a nightmare because people could take it multiple times. And the one thing about anonymous surveys that people take for granted, it increases the likelihood of trolling. People put awful things on anonymous surveys. They're not helpful at all. And so you imagine somebody like me who has to do all this analysis, and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. Um, but anonymous, I think you have to be real with where you are. Um, when you're just beginning, if you're just in a rebuilding stage, if you're just trying to build our culture, nothing is wrong with anonymous survey, right? Because sometimes any data is better than no data because you need a starting point and you need a foundation. But when you're really serious about making data-driven and empirically led, led decisions, then you need to have confidential surveys and you need to, to be very clear that these are confidential. You need to be very clear who has the ability to see it? How is it reported? I think one of the, here's the truth. Even if I say a survey is anonymous, nobody, no employee ever believes it. They always think that there's somebody who's sitting down, twiddling their mustache and reading every, who has time for that, right? Like I worked at Walmart. I mean, at that time, Walmart was about 2.2 .2 million people. When that survey comes in, we're talking about 97% response rate. It has taken forever for that file to open. Who has time to read every single comment? That, that is insanity. I can't do that. Like, I know you think when you take that survey, like, you, what, how you feel is the most important thing at that time. But I'm just trying to understand what's happening. Um, so that's the first thing. I think what it... it People just don't trust their organization. So it always gets back to trust, right? And it could be a sign of a broken culture, but it could also be a, a sign of somebody trying to build trust. And the first thing they're saying is, here is, I just need to know how you feel. The one thing is if you're trying to repair your culture or build your culture, or truly get that trust is you can do anonymous a couple times, a couple pulses, but you need to act. And the more you act, and the more you are honest, and the more you're transparent, and the more you report your findings, as you start moving into conf confidential surveys, then people, because people will tell you their business regardless, I promise you. I don't know why people, people will complain and then write me a whole paragraph about how they're feeling. They will put names and dates, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is too much. I, don't, I didn't need to know. Um, but I think it just depends on where you are. And I think, you know, as we look at some of the cultures that I think are being broken right now, um, they may need to think of having like maybe anonymous pulses, which is like short things that you're just trying to find out some key broad strokes and information. But anything related to strategic decisions, do I need to create a new career development program? Do how are like a DEI, how are people feeling? You know, are there any ethical issues? Are there any uh, microaggression type issues that may be impacting the experiences different groups are having or the entire group is having? That is strategic. Strategic surveys should be confidential and they should be tracked and be able to be tied back to HRS metrics. But if you just want to know, you know, in general, how's everybody feeling? What's the general temperature of the organization? Go on on about It's not that big of a deal. If somebody wants to take a survey five times, get on that. You mentioned that people need to know what to do with those people analytics. And that's where storytelling comes into my brain. Because which we can collect all the data in the world, but numbers mean nothing if you don't give it context and relatability. What, what, how do we get there? So it's a skill that people have to learn. And I think it also gets down to there's a lot of people who could work with data, but not people data. And to your point, that's why you have to be able to tell the story of your people. The one rule that I've had and I've always had and I keep it near and dear to me is that every I have a big responsibility because every data point 
is a human it's a person and that person affects other people and as long as i remember that when i look at data and i look at trends and i look at patterns i have to take care and how i'm reporting and really try to understand the interactions between multiple variables before i come to any sort of conclusions or make recommendations to leaders about what they should and should not do i really think it 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 boils down to us it's hard, right? It's it's one of those things where it's hard to think about how do we really train people to understand data, but I think really trying to see the human and I know that sounds kind it of is so it's compassion. You're you're working with humanity and compassion, not uh legend, yeah. right? It's not columns, these are Right, right. Like if if I count dollars, I don't hurt a dollar if I don't count it, right? I don't hurt the dollar dollar will be fine, right? Um, but with a person, right? That person, you make that decision and it's wrong. The the the, the consequence of that decision. It it could go anywhere from a lawsuit to like harm. Um, it for me it's not worth it because you know you did not contextualize the data. I am a full believer in storytelling, and I think part of it is data is, and a lot of leaders will not admit, to, but data can be very intimidating and very confusing. And one thing I've learned about leaders is they don't like to pre they don't like to show that. They don't understand something and they, they're intimidated by what this data is saying, especially if the data doesn't say what they thought it was going to say, right? And I, a lot of what I have to do sometimes is to tell a leader, you have an, you have an ugly baby, yeah, you know? And so uh, I always have to be like, okay, so people think your baby's ugly. It's okay, okay. We could pretty this up, it's all right. What, what can we do, right? <laughs> right? Like a lot of times that is what I have to do. That is my job. That is what my job is to get them to trust me. We're on the same team and I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. And so I go from once upon a time because what I encourage people to do when you are doing employee voice work is understand your people, understand your industry, understand the lingo so that you can tell the story appropriately. There are many people in my field who we're very academic. I blame us, right? We're very academic. And I will tell you, our oh, work is boring. Okay. Working with data is boring. And I'm not even going to lie to you. It's, it's boring, right? A lot of what I have to do is the most boring stuff in the world. It's structuring data, cleaning data. It is not sexy at all. It's boring. And I can go in and drone on and on and 19% of people say this and 20% of people say that and everybody glazes over in the room. We don't care, but I need to inject life in the story. And I also need to see, and this is what we can do. These are the solutions. And so you really start with true storytelling, which allows your voice to remain in the room when you're not there anymore, telling the story, right? Every story you ever think of that you remember, if you, you don't always remember the first person who ever told you that story, but that story lingers, you can hear their voice, and a really good storyteller, whenever you think of that story, that's the voice you hear that person who brought it to life for you. And that's what storytelling with data is. Storytelling with data means that you're, you're moving past the data into the insights of the data. What is the data actually saying and what is it telling you? And what can we do with this data? And that's that storytelling with data. And that is such a rush for me. And it's such a skill that's learned with time because you really have to trust yourself in recognizing that you're speaking on behalf of multiple people and the voice that you're using is yours and it's just a vessel but this is a story of many people and you're advocating action in order to create the outcomes that you're trying to you're trying to make so it takes a lot of practice it takes a lot of trust and you start from scratch. You really do start with, well, once upon a time, there were people in an organization <laughs> and bring color to the data. And I think once you move away from the academics, just these, you need to be steeped in, in some theory, 
but you move away from that and you really bring life, bring insight, bring context, bring solution. That creates the story of the data. And that's the fun part. That's the part that a lot of people don't get to see. That's the fun part of uh, working with data. So Khalifa, um, give me a win. Give me an example where this storytelling has actually had listening to employees, collecting data properly has actually moved the needle for an organization. Oh my God. Can I tell you a fun story? I always tell this story. because it's one of my... I love fun stories. They're my favorite. It's one of my fun ones. It will seem so boring, but I promise you, I promise it's not as climactic because it's so silly. Okay. So I'll go back to when I was a Walmart. So I had been I had been reading a lot of survey results that were coming in about the offices and randomly in the qualitative data, I had noticed a pattern, but I, I, I put it aside. I didn't think about it. And then Walmart was in a process of uh, working on creating a new campus. They were looking at creating new buildings and whatnot. The offices are essentially huge warehouses, okay? It is just dark, huge warehouses. That's how it feels <laughs> when you go there. And, it, you know, they were going to do it. And so at the very last minute, my manager said, hey, Khalifa, before they start uh, working on the architecture, before they start making announcements, can we just check one more time, send the survey out? Let's just make sure we know exactly what the employees want. I was like, Cool. So I'm doing a standard, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want that what kind of, um, you know, what kind of resources you want in there? What will make a really nice office? Da, da, da. And at the very last minute, I thought, you know what I keep seeing on surveys coming up randomly in open text that we don't ask about? Light. People kept talking about how it was dark. People kept talking about light. I was like, I'm going to throw in a question in here about light. So I said, what, what is it? Because it's like, what's important to you? So I put light and I said, light, artificial, light, natural. Threw it in there. I know my boss probably watched me cross that light or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's nagging me. Like, I've heard, like, people keep talking about it and it keeps coming up randomly. Let's throw it in there. So I get the, the I, we, we do the survey, we bring it back out. I mean, light is up there. <laughs> light, light is out there. Folks want windows. Let me tell you, folks wanted some windows. <laughs> so I write this report and I was like, what is really important to people is they want light and they want natural light. So as we build these new buildings, as we spend these multi-millions of dollars on this new campus, people really want natural light. They really want, they, they want light. If you could give them any lights, but they really want some natural light to have a feel good. And what was hilarious to me is when they went back to the, they did their architectural plans and all that stuff. There was an announcement that finally came, a communication that finally came from the CEO, Doug McMillan at the time. And towards the very end of the communication, it said, and yes, there will be lots of, there will be lots of lackeys. There will be lots. There will be lots of lights, and you know, um, and then people had a chance to see what the architecture plans look like. And it was hilarious to me because it was this random thing that I threw in there because I, of all the things that I had analyzed, and it stuck with me that there was this weird pattern of people constantly talking about darkness, right? It was this weird pattern of people talking about it, and it was me listening to things that, under normal circumstances, somebody would have just said it's not important, but it felt important, important enough that the CEO then addressed it. And it felt like a win. You would think this is something that's not important. It's not something that you think about. But in people's want to have a good experience and be productive in these offices, they just wanted something as simple. We want light. So now in this multi-million dollar um, plans that you do, you're like, yo, let's Make sure we have some extra windows. Let's make sure there's light. Let's make, and that's the CEO listening and the real estate folks listening and the operations people listening and the finance person listening that there is this thing that our employees are asking us for. And I was able to be the vessel for it. 
And for me, that was a huge win. Under normal circumstances, you think comfort, you think equity, you would never think just light, which also goes to show you that sometimes the things people want is not a lot. People are sometimes asking for this, what they consider to be the smallest thing. But we're so busy trying to create these programs that are intricate and complex, and then we wonder why we're not moving the needle, because that's important to us as leaders, not to our employees. And I think shutting up and listening is what we need to do some more. So that's why I was like, it was a weird, it's a weird example, but it's one that I absolutely love sharing because it's so practical <laughs> that you don't think about it. So an organization might kind of, sort of collect data or they don't really at all. Do you start, like, where do you start? Is it pulse surveys? Is it take a crack at what a survey is? I say, if you want to just start somewhere, start with a survey. Start, and that's like, what, two points where you're just trying to start to an anonymous survey to start. Test the waters, test your capacity, test your analytic skill. Start with, just start with a survey. The problem is, of course, with anonymous surveys, if you're really trying to get some demographic data, you're gonna have to lengthen the survey and ask those questions. So anonymous surveys really should be long. Um, but start with a survey, only because from a logistic standpoint, it is much faster and easier for you and so that's why i always say just start with a survey right a civic could be your best friend but don't lean on it as you mature there's several other ways to use technology in your favor there are more ways to to really advance and get more analytics and and get fancy and do more on it but if you're just starting out my rule just ask the question just ask the question. I won't say focus groups as a start because focus groups could be unwieldy. And one of the side effects of focus groups is sometimes the loudest person in the room is who dominates your focus group if it's not well, if it's not well managed. And sometimes that's hard when you're just starting out to understand how to manage because it means that new people doing this new thing. And you don't always want to bring out an outside facilitator to do that. So you may not have the funds for it. You know, a well designed city. If you're going to invest in something, a well-designed survey, if you need me to build one for y'all people, I can do that. <laughs> oh, there'll be links. There'll be links in the show notes for sure. <laughs> I can do a well-designed survey for you. What excites you? Technology is such a big part of this. Humanity is such a big part of this. So we're looking more organizations suddenly. I mean, I don't know what the hell happened. Maybe a pandemic where suddenly organizations seem to start giving a shit about happened, employees. Yeah. So what excites you about the future of people analytics? Two things. I think during the pandemic, technology advanced in such like people technology, communication technology, asynchronous technology. It advanced at such a rate that it's allowing us to do so many other things. And people started to pay attention to really try and use technology, which makes me incredibly happy. The nerd part of me is just happily dancing and singing that there are different ways to collect data. So I love it. Um, I think also what really excites me right now about the future of work is people can't ignore people anymore. The people aspect of work cannot be ignored. We're trying, as you can see now, we're trying to go back to it. We can't. We can try. We can. It's our kick. HR moved into the future just a little bit. HR has been a dinosaur for a very long time. I'll say it. I'm in it. Okay. You know, I can talk about my people. We've, you know, we've we've been dinosaurs. Everything is just one correct way to do it, which is not the way. It's not the truth. You know, I think what people discovered very quickly is when a company has to do something, they can do it. If you need me to work remotely, I can. So you have all these people, for example, people with different abilities and disabilities who found out that all of these accommodations that they had asked for, they could have gotten if companies had just tried. There's no going back from that. There's no going back for people realizing that they don't have to stay in traffic if they don't want to. There's no going back to realizing that people can spend time with their families and work, right? There's, there's no going back from that. And and honestly, with all these layoffs, there will be no going back from that either. When the market swings in the other direction, the trust is broken, right? So a lot of these giants that people are like, I must work for them, they're great. You realize that they're, they're just companies too, right? And they 
So I'm I'm happy with what I call a little bit of an awakening. You know, I don't want to call it the great anything because I'm sick of the great stuff, you know, labeling everything. But there just seems to be an awakening where people are realizing that work is a part of their lives and companies are realizing that these are humans. These are humans. And I think those two things together, then you mix up some new technology. Oh, yeah. The future is bright for us. So I got to ask the last question, Khalifa, which is, and I think it's a perfect time for it. What's one simple action people can do right now to improve relationships at work? So this is going to feel very counterintuitive. But Ooh, do it. Do it. Take a break from work. Um. And I just, I mean, like, take, like, don't stop working. <laughs> I mean, like, take your PTO, take the days off, take a, you know, take a couple of days, and don't, don't just try to do one long. Let me just take two weeks off because you'll find at the end of that you're not as relaxed as you think you are. You need to take multiple time, take the time that you've given. And the reason why I'm saying that is, you need to fill yourself up. You need to take care of yourself. What I've found is when you fill yourself up and take care of yourself. You can go in and be great at work and you will, you're willing to help. You have more room for empathy and care and for building relationships and for being a good coworker and being a good manager. You have to take the time to fill yourself up. Relationships at work depend on your relationship with you. And I think that is what I really want people to know. And if, if you don't remember anything that I said this entire time, yeah, you got to take care of yourself. That is Dr. Khalifa Oliver, who is the founder and managing partner of Deep Dive Consulting, which is all over those people analytics to make the employee experience so much better for those you're responsible for. Yes. Thank you so much, Khalifa. Oh, well, thank you for having me anytime. I appreciate it. <laughs> and that'll do it for another episode of Relationships at Work, the guide for emerging leaders to create a workplace we love. If you've enjoyed this podcast, Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please take a moment and go over to one of the rating systems, Spotify, Apple. Both of those do that right off their apps. You just go in there and you leave a rating and review, and I'd really appreciate it. Little things like that, big things to me, but little things to you uh, are huge for the podcast for discoverability and, uh, and yeah, listenership. So as we're still growing the podcast, I really appreciate those listening, like yourself, to uh, make that little extra nudge to help the podcast out. Please, pretty please. Cool. Sounds good. Take care.